Hey everybody, this is Will and welcome to Will's Personal Development Podcast Show. My name is Will and today we have a friend on the show. His name is DJ Foley and he runs his own podcast, the Medium Brown Podcast. And uh, DJ Foley is someone I know in real life and um, uh, he's a good friend. And uh, yeah, I I, uh, really want to kind of just have a conversation and do like a fun little um, podcast episode where we bring on a friend and we have a chat because I think there's there's a lot of like, uh, you know, very formal like person A interviews, person B shows. And um, I kind of want to move away from that. I've done episodes like that in the past and um, just kind of move towards just like a fun chat um, about our lives and, you know, pop culture and stuff like that. Um, still focus on personal development to an extent, but I just really like how certain shows are really blowing up lately, like uh, uh, Girls Gotta Eat and uh, Call Her Daddy and uh, Joe Rogan. And they're, they're oftentimes just kind of like conversing, like having fun and talking. Mm-hmm. So uh, DJ Foley, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having me, Will. It's so great to be here. Uh, thank you for that amazing introduction. And I completely agree. Uh, On my show, the Medium Brown Podcast, you know, the idea behind that show was to just start a conversation. I wanted to have a podcast that felt like you came to hang out with me and my friends. So I'm happy you're thinking that way. I think that's such a great way to have your show be directed. Awesome. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be kind of touching on like the four main pillars of personal development. Uh, I know there's probably more pillars uh, if you really wanted to, but we're going to be covering um, broadly uh, health, wealth, uh, love, and happiness. And we're just going to be kind of like talking about that and immersing it into uh, conversations about pop culture and what our interests are and, and just having a good time there. So let's let's start with health because I know um, both of us are very into kind of like staying fit, staying healthy, mm-hmm. and... and uh, going to the gym and lifting and um yeah i think you know we we all have different motivations for why we do this and so i'd love to kind of like hear why you did it and and why you started uh working out um so that is a very great question will and it's got a couple different answers so where i am right now in my life I have the motivation to work out, to be as fit as I can, because I like to move. I like to be active. I like to play tennis. I like to go run and walk with my dog. I like to play basketball. I like to swim. I like to do so many things outdoors. I love the outdoors. And now that I'm getting older, I'm now in my early 30s, I want to start adopting the lifestyle and the mindset and the same consistent activities So I could have a long and healthy life. But before I got to this point right now, my motivation was between being a better version of myself, being a better Foley, but it was also a lot of mental health I was kind of fighting with. I I was very self-conscious about my body. I still am pretty self-conscious, but there was a point where I had just such body dysmorphia that I would make plans to go somewhere or let's say, Will, you would invite me uh, to come to your house to for a party. And you told me, hey, D- hey, Foley, um, on Monday, on Monday when we talked, like, hey, dude, Friday is going to be lit. It's going to be a great party. I'm like, oh, man, I can't wait to hang out with Will. Friday before the party, I'm in the mirror and I'm like, I don't know if I can go to this party. Everything looks terrible. I look huge. Like, I, what am I doing with my body? And it just took a lot of... A lot of self-love and self-care. I know that some people may think that it's kind of like a hoax. I I got a lot of self, gave myself a lot of self-love. I actually went to therapy because I wanted to be stronger mentally and I wanted to um, learn my emotions. And a mixture of that is what, you know, and changing that has now continued my journey into fitness. But I was just very competitive too. I came from a martial arts background. So when I was younger, I played martial arts. And when I got into college, I wasn't able to um, still study, so I got into lifting, and I just fell in love with t- t- and fell in love with it then. And you know, now I've met you through CrossFit, so yeah, man, just just sticking with it. So what what gets me every day is I'm just trying to have fun. Now I go on long walks to have fun. I work out to see 
you know, how much stronger I can get. I see a lot of new movements online. I want to become more mobile. I'm stretching more. I'm learning to build strength in a different type of way. That's awesome. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting because, um, you know, I appreciate what you said there and, um, it's, it's so interesting to kind of see, see how, how, you know, multidimensional people are. Um, sometimes, um, you just don't know, you know, you, you seem like a pretty confident dude. So, um, <laughs> Thank you. I was, I was a little surprised about that, which, which is, um, I mean, it's awesome. I, I think everyone struggles with certain things. Um, I, I struggle with them in, in different ways. Um, so for me, I think, um, I was always kind of like that skinny guy with like a, a pretty high metabolism. So, so I was blessed with the metabolism, but, um, I was always kind of, uh, skinny, kind of nerdy. And so, um, there's definitely, uh, some, sh- a lot of shyness and insecurity there. And, um, uh, I think going to the gym was like, uh, it was definitely a way of, um, improving myself, uh, for the ladies to an extent. And then like, it's, it's definitely changed over the years. Um, like right now I've, I've definitely changed my motivations to more like, um, I'm here to just stay healthy and and fit Mm -hmm. for myself. And, Mm -hmm. um, my emphasis on like maximizing the muscle size I get has, it's kind of like reduced. So it's, it's less bodybuilding focused and more, more just like, uh, CrossFit and like um, a- aerobically focused, and it's mm-hmm. that's that's because like I just kind of um, I burned out um, a bit from just kind of trying to chase how I looked and how I came across, and yeah, when you put in a lot a of lot. work, yeah, yeah what you say? Happened, I said that happens so much. I said that happens a lot. Like for me, mm-hmm. I burnt out as well, and you know you're chasing this ghost of maybe what you were. Like for me, I chased. 189 i was 189 in my early 20s and i thought that was like i thought that was like the peak shit like i thought that was the strongest i'd ever been and i chased that for years and it burnt me out then i realized that i'm actually stronger than i was then and my body needs certain things that i didn't know it needed back then that's how i was able to achieve that but that's just so like chasing that always burns you out yeah and you were also talking about like um your motivations and and that sparked something um because there's a few other uh people at our gym and i've asked them about like how they got into this and um uh, it reminded me of of one guy uh his name's randy and he he basically said that he's he really kind of like does what he does because it strengthens his mind it, it kind of like he it's not so much a physical it's it's kind of like a mental practice for him so it, it was just so fascinating to see all these different like reasons. Cause like Randy, at least in, to me, he's, he's pretty jacked. He's muscular. I mean, he has a like really good physique. And like, if, yeah. if I had his physique, I'd be like, like 95% there. So yeah, I, that's how I feel too, man. You know, <laughs> I see Randy, I'm like, man, if I would look like Randy, man, I would be killing it. <laughs> yeah. Know? Yeah. But yeah, Randy's but on his own mental. journey. It's- yeah, yeah go it's ahead, a mental go ahead. journey, and it is. I'm just saying there's I'm just saying there's just so much to that mental aspect. I was saying that, you know, with Randy, he says that, you know, we look at him and you see him, you're like, man, I wish I could get that strong, but for him it's not about the strength. It's the mental thing, and there's so much discipline that goes into it, and I think that's what a lot of people kind of miss, like how you get to Randy's physique or just a physique or, you know, even to your self-will as you're continually working out. The fact that you are in the routine of it, that's that's such a key element. And that's actually the, one of the things I enjoy about working out as well. I love the routine. I work out every day around five or six, especially during quarantine. I work out for, about for an hour, an hour and a half. I do weight, I lift, and then I have some sort of cardio or some sort of, or I do like boxing now. I've been shadow boxing or I'll practice stretching. I'll do some mobility work. Or do some Tabata or a jump rope. I'll do um, this like RPM kind of rope thing. There's just so many things you can do once you kind of just kind of cling on to that mental part of the routine. Like the, the fitness part is the easy part. I think like working out is the easy part. You just have to get there mentally. Yeah, yeah. I think like a lot of things just come down to your mind at the end of the day. Like, um, you know, it's it's about like 
getting in your head that like you can do this and then actually doing it more than the physical elements of it. Like even like I'm starting to learn that even like the physical things are all go back to the brain as well. Like um, I remember asking my friend in high school, why didn't you, why don't you do football? Cause he was this like huge muscular guy. And he's like, well, football is actually like very, like, you have to be really smart to play. Like there's all these like, you know, different, uh, you know, plays and stuff that you have to memorize in your head. So it's, I, I, I think, yeah, every, a lot of things are mental at the end of the day. I a hundred percent agree. A lot of it is mental and a lot of it is also, I guess, being patient with yourself. So there's always like two ways to attack things. And that's kind of one thing I don't like about, fitness culture is there's two ways to attack things with yourself you can do it positively you could say all right Foley we're going to do this we're going to wake up we're going to walk we're going to lift we're going to do x reps and then we're going to chill and that's it or you can go the kind of that that self kind of hate that dark place that sometimes you do pull from even though you may be very much positive to yourself but there's a come on man get up like what are you doing you're lazy you're crap like why aren't you strong enough? Like you should be better than this. And I think if you give too much to that negativity, it's hard for you to find the mental strength and where all to put those routines of fitness in your life. Yeah. What, what do you think about like self-love in terms of um, why people should do fitness? Like, do you think there's a wrong way of going about um, like, should someone do fitness just just to get women? Like, is that a, a bad approach? I I believe so, yes. I think that ultimately it's a losing game. It's a lose-lose situation. A, if you're getting into fitness just to get women, get a mate, get a partner, whatever, be more attractive to someone else, you're going to start down a slippery slope that you're never, ever going to be able to recover from. So you're stepping into the gym thinking, I need to get fit, I need to get a six-pack, I need to get ripped so I can get the attention of this person. So you're automatically telling yourself that your success is 100%, 100% dependent on the approval of someone else. That one person, girls, women, become your friends, your family. You become obsessed with what people think about you. If you go to the gym with the mindset of, you know, I need to change my life, I feel that I'm getting tired when I'm doing some basic things. I feel that when I should be having fun dancing, when I go out with my boys and I'm dancing, I'm I'm out of breath. I I can't go on a long walk with my dogs. Like I'm, you know, the girl I'm seeing, she wants to go on these hikes and I love them, but I find myself winded early. I need to change something. I need to learn something. I need to grow. I want to get stronger. That's the kind of attitude you need if you're going to go into the gym and get into fitness. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, we were talking about quarantine and I think this uh, last week or so, um, I think I really kind of stepped into like that mindset of, yeah, I'm doing this for myself. I was very proud of myself to continue exercising because not a lot of people do. Um, and then, so what I do is like, I try and go to um, a Zoom uh, workout class or uh, CrossFit um, gym kind of offers those. And um my focus there is just to, it's, it's more so about my own health, my energy, my focus, my, um, my own, like, uh, my self, my own self-confidence there. Yeah. So in terms of like fitness influencers, do you have any like celebrities or, uh, influencers online that, that kind of inspire you? So for me, I have a few, if I could just pull up Instagram right quick, let me see. There are, well, of course, CrossFit game athletes. I'm a huge Matt Fraser fan. I, I'm i just astounded that he is just such a monster. I don't know him on a personal level. I can't talk to his personal beliefs. But I do think as an athlete, he is awesome. Uh, there is also Own It Academy, which I love. They do a lot of great kettlebell work. I mean, it is just fantastic. There are, again, Patrick Vellner, um, Sarah Sigmund's daughter, gosh, just 
so many different fitness individuals. I mean, I can't even like, as I'm scrolling right now, I'm like thinking of some, there's this body weight guy that I love um, on Instagram. He's super, he has really great gymnastics work and a lot of great flexibility and mobility and strength. And he's also just crazy ripped, but he started doing just mostly body weight stuff. And in time, he became more, he got more into kettlebell. He got more into lifting and he, he looks like a superhero. I can't think of his name right now. Um, but I, I really enjoyed looking at him on Instagram. He has great, great folk, like great, great videos on like lifts and stuff. Like his, uh, his muscle ups are incredible. He does really clean movements and he's always, always focused on form. So I, I really appreciate that. There's a guy named Bart Kwan. Oh, on yeah. Instagram that I follow as well. Um, he is a really cool dude. I, I just, it was just funny. I was talking to my wife about it that when I was on his Instagram, he does a lot of fitness stuff, but he's also like really into kind of like military and guns. And I've noticed that, I don't know if you seen it through your analytics or maybe, I don't know what it is about like kind of CrossFit, but a lot of like CrossFit athletes, there's a lot of like ties to military, ties to like Definitely. The sport of gun hunting fitness. I feel that as soon as I started doing CrossFit and I started to like buy gear, now I see a bunch of like tactical <laughs> ads on Instagram. <laughs> Do you feel that it's like there was something that I keep laughing at? There's this um, gun box. Or, or it's a it's a safety box, and for folks listening, I do not own a gun, um, but I keep getting this tactical box ad, and it's like keep what's important to you safe, and it's like somebody puts a gun, like a Colt forty five, in this box and like closes it and locks it and lo- and walks away, and then it's like keep your family safe. Guy puts the gun box under the bed. I'm like, what is this? <laughs> like I just do. CrossFit. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of military people who do CrossFit for some reason. And it's fantastic. I think that's really great. I I just appreciate how I've I've always had friends who were in the military and the thing about CrossFit that I did I just love and I'm happy I joined is for the community. And I've met so many great men and women who are serving this country, who are just ending their tour, who are in the middle of their tour, who are beginning their tour. And I love it. And I just really appreciate the opportunity to talk with them, to get to know them and their families. It's just, it's just great, man. It's just yeah, like, I, I think you know, people who don't do CrossFit think of it as some type of cult, and it's not. It's it's not a cult. Um, it's it's just people um, having a good time and um, you know doing something together. Like, um, you know, we work out together, and then you know sometimes we hang out together. So, yeah, there's there's definitely a exactly. Um, and then, all right, go ahead. Go I ahead. think what. Oh, sorry. No, I'm just going to say that it, that really frustrates me because, yes, there are some CrossFit af- affiliates that have the go home, no bitches, you better sweat it out attitude and people have ribo and get hurt and all of that. Yes. And that's such a small group, that, but that's not why CrossFit was founded. CrossFit was founded to make sure to help people become healthy, to give us fitness and mental balance and nutrition for us to change our lives and also like for a community to help a community become fit the thing about crossfit that's so amazing it's not a cult it's just a community of people who just want you to continue to be the best that you want to be who want to see you finish who want to see you grow who want to see you get stronger and people need to really think yeah and going back to your influencers I, i didn't want to interrupt when you were mentioning them but um, I definitely follow those um, some of those people as well. Um, of course, all the CrossFit athletes you mentioned, um, they're pretty cool. Um, I, I like Matt Frazier. Probably, he's probably like in my top two or three because uh, right now, he not only is he winning a lot, but he has some like good, like, he's just a cool person. Like he seems pretty humble and he's, he's uh, very focused on like putting in the work and like, you hear that uh, mindset a lot in, in what he puts out. Yeah, I, I 100% agree. I think it, you know, I, when it comes to social media and my influencer, I, I follow a lot of some some of the main CrossFitters that I know of and some random fitness gurus and fitness people. I used to follow a lot of bodybuilders, and I just kind of have moved away from that because I'm more about 
again, more of that kind of positive mentality. Like I like to see Instagrams of athletes and of fitness professionals that show us just their them living their lives, maybe what they eat, not that perfect that perfect salad, them working out, them struggling at a workout. You know, I see like I, I, I follow a lot more athletes and fitness people on Instagram that show their process. I'm kind of overseeing like that amazing snatch or wow, that's so cool that they're so strong. Like I, I want to see like how you train. I think that's really interesting. I love seeing tidbits about how they eat or maybe some things they do during a workout to help make my form better, that kind of stuff. And I think that the conversation should be shifting. Towards yeah, that's a good point. I think um, I'm on a social media diet on Instagram now, but back when I was on it, um, there's a few influencers that really kind of showed me that like, there's all sorts of different like uh, body types that are attractive. And I, I think that that message, although it's spreading, it should be spread more because um, especially in the CrossFit community, you get like all these different types of body types that that I find attractive. And um, I don't know, it just, it just uh, opens people's minds. Yeah, it, it's funny because the first time I saw a person that had the same type of physique as me was when I started doing CrossFit. Wow. To be honest, I and I have been lifting I've been lifting since I was, what, 18, 19, and I'm 31 now. So, again, I'm not a professional lifter or an Olympic lifter or anything, but I've been in the gym for a while. I've seen a lot of different strong bros. I've seen a lot of different, like, extremely lean, natty or unnatty or, um, you know, people who are cutting, who are bulking. I've bulked, I've cut, you know, I've done all those things. But in CrossFit, I actually started to see people with the bodies that like a, with my body and the body that my body changes. And that's just strange. It's just the first time I've, that's what I've. And just to give the listeners some reference, like when did you start CrossFit and how long had you been lifting before CrossFit? So I started CrossFit, it is 2020 now. I started CrossFit in early 2017. Got it. In early 2017, I started CrossFit. Got it. And be before then, I had been lifting since 2010. Yeah, so that's a long time before you found someone who looked like you. Uh, that's pretty cool. It's, that's awesome that you yeah. joined community that you love. Um, so uh, I want to mention one more thing before we move on to another category of um, self-development. Um, going back to what you said about Bar Kwan, interesting story. Um, he used to be a Asian comedian, Asian American comedian on YouTube. Like that's how he got his start. Really? That's why he looks... There was something about him that looked very familiar. Yeah, his videos went fire. He's like an wow. OG YouTuber. I used to watch his stuff a lot of time. Um, and he had a lot of, he played a yeah. lot of Asian stereotype, like skits. Um, and uh -huh. his videos went viral. This was like OG, like 2010 YouTube. And then like, he's definitely evolved a lot. Now he's definitely more fitness focused. Wow, yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, something about him looked for me. Yeah, you, you've probably seen one of his skits in the past. Um, he's a really funny guy. I kind of I used to follow him a lot, and then I just kind of lost touch. But every now and then, I'll, I'll jump back to mm -hmm. him. And it seems like he's much more uh, you know, right. powerlifting focused these days. Yeah, nice. Yeah. So let's move on to um, another pillar of personal development. So we covered health. Let's move on to wealth. Um, so we're all kind of like trying to improve our careers and stuff. For me, um, I think uh, my goal is, my goal one day is to to make six figures and then um, move up from there. And so currently um, I'm just kind of like, one thing I'm doing is um, like courses. So I'm taking like online courses now to kind of just like improve my life in general. I don't know exactly how it will 
uh, benefit me, but I know it will in some way. Like uh, um, there's this uh, website called masterclass.com and. Ah, okay. Uh, Which ones have you taken? I took a lot. I, um, I, I bought it around uh, Christmas. So it's been about five months. And so I've taken Bob Iger's. He's like the CEO of Disney. Um, I took Malcolm yeah, Gladwell's because cool. I write a lot and um, he, he talks about writing. And um, I also took uh -huh. Howard Schultz's. Wow, man. I keep seeing the Gordon Ramsay one, the Neil Gaiman, the Howard Schultz, and there was the guy who writes comedy. Uh, he wrote Forgetting hmm. Sarah Marshall. Anyway. Yeah, Masterclass. Oh, I'm thinking about that. Okay. Oh, I'm no. Sorry. Yeah, that, that was good. Um, yeah, so yeah, so that's, that's kind of what I've been doing to just kind of like better my life. Um, uh, in terms of the finances, uh, but, uh, you know, talk about whatever you want to on that. It doesn't have to be about making more money. Some people are content where they are, could just be managing money or how people think about money. What, what are your thoughts on just wealth in general these days? So on wealth in general, for myself, I am just trying to continue to work and save so I can be a homeowner and to slowly pay down my student loans. That's just kind of like the truth of it all. But my my goal is to become a art director of some sort, just to maybe just do a lot of high-level creative thinking and a lot of high-level creative ideas. As far as it comes to money, my goal would be to, well, I would love for the podcast to take off and for me to have bigger guests and for me to raise money that I can put back into communities of color directly. And I mean, creating centers or just cutting checks to organizations and so on and so forth. But personally, I would just like my student loans to be paid off and I would be very content. I, when it comes to money, I, when I was a kid, I used to be like, oh, I can't, I want to be rich. I want to be rich. And when I was a young adult, like, man, yeah, I got to have a lot of money. And something just kind of hit me, I guess, in my mid 20s that I, with more money comes a lot more, just not really problems, but just more opportunities, but opportunities to put you in know, more situations where you may need more money. I just want to have enough money where I can pay my loans off and just afford to travel a bit and live the life of my family. If I were to ever become a huge media star and have billions and millions of dollars, yes, the truth is I would pay off my debts, but the rest of that money would go into communities, would go into making change because of, I don't know, money is not really that important to me on that kind of level. If, if that makes sense. Like, it's funny, I've, I've been taking classes. I've been taking a Domestica class um, on drawing female action heroes for comics. I'm taking that. And there are, I picked up a couple more painting classes. I've been buying some art classes, but it hasn't been so much for me to, I guess, make money as in like three figures, but it it's to help train my eye. I've becoming, I'm becoming a better artist and that's helping my career work in my nine to five. So DJ Foley is my superhero name. <laughs> my, uh, my regular identity is just a nine to five guy. Like, like my mm -hmm. listeners are our listeners. Yeah. That's so, interesting. Yeah. I think I get the sense you're very more focused on giving back and helping others. Yeah, man. I, I don't really know what I do with a million dollars or a billion. I don't know what I need in my life. But for me, peace, my peace comes from new memories and travel and relaxation. So for me, wealth would mean, ah, here we go. Now I'm just kind of putting my thoughts together. To me, wealth is having the time to invest in the things that you enjoy. So if I had enough money to do that for the rest of my life, I'm good. 
And one of the things I enjoy is giving back. One of the things I enjoy are helping people and helping communities. I love to teach. It would be great to be in a position where I could teach. So as long as I have enough money to do the things I love, to better myself, to learn, to read, to do my art, to to stay in love with my passions, and enough money to put food on my table for my family, to make sure that my wife knows that her adventures are fully funded and she's got a partner to help her on her adventures, I'm good, man. Like, I'm, I'm perfect. That's really all I would need. Yeah, I, I think I know what you're saying. You know, there's like that base level where you need and you have to have enough money to meet your needs you know food shelter and stuff like that and then you know anything else is kind of just only beneficial if to you at least if it kind of enriches your experiences in life and and what you enjoy doing right so like if you had like any money beyond that you know you probably wouldn't be able to spend it because you know what are you going to do with an extra $6 million, you know? Exactly. Like, what am I going to do with, if if you woke up, Will, and you looked around and you thought to yourself, you're like, damn, I don't have to go to work today. I don't have to, like, my bills are paid. I've got food. Huh. That's it. I'm going to go read. I'm going to go play some video games. I'm going to go study that master class. I'm going to go outside and stretch. I'm going to go work out. I'm going to go make breakfast for my family. You know, I'm going to I'm going to go spend time with my family. Also, too, that's really important to me. So I think that just having what I need, I don't need a million, six billion dollars somewhere. Like, where am I going to go? I can already, you know, if I can pay to go on a trip here and there, that's fine. I don't need to constantly, like, travel the world like constantly. I like to settle in places. I would love to, if I had a lot of money, what I would do is in the summer, I would go on holiday, like in Europe. I would spend the entire summer not at home. I take my family somewhere and we just bum around there. And if it's in like a different country, we'd visit that country. And, you know, especially kids of color having that experience of being in Europe and being in Asia and being in Africa and being in South America, being able to take in different cultures as a kid of color if i had the wealth to be able to do that that's all i really would need i wouldn't need for us to like be throwing money and have this crazy opulent life because i think too much that would affect my kids yeah i, I think that's interesting because you i think you're in the minority with that i think that a lot of young young men especially they want millions of dollars they want to be famous and if they had it they would just be spending it on mansions cars and travel and they think that's what would make them happy i feel like you have a really good like set point on what's enough for your happiness like a a very reasonable sustainable set point um so that's yeah thanks man i mean i try yeah so fun question would you be if you had millions of dollars what would you do with it? Would you just like, after you've gone on one or two trips, would you just leave it in your savings account or would it all be spent within that year? So if I just had a million dollars, yeah, let's say you had like a million dollars right now. Okay. If I was given a million dollars right now, I'd pay off my student loans I'd buy a house. I would invest some money into my retirement. I'd invest some money for my kids and my family. Again, this is like only a couple thousand dollars, or maybe like a hundred thousand dollars or two hundred thousand dollars for and then the rest I'd set up a because this is a million dollars too. It's not like it's a billion, but a million dollars. I see if I could set up a school that did art or I'd start, um, I start some sort of like school or place for kids of color and kids to practice the arts and stuff. I don't know, like right in a, like directly in a community and that'd be cool. Interesting. Yeah. I think the reason I brought that up was like, I think a lot of like, if 
a lot of people would take that money and it would be, it'd just be gone like that. Like it's so easy to spend money these days, like one or two, like some there are mansions that are like $25 million. Like uh, just buy a house, you can yeah. just clear that money off. So, um, I mean, I think a lot of that too is just because the psychology behind the consumerism, you know, Western consumerism is that you should always just want more and that if you don't get more, it's not of quality, right? Like the difference between a $5 pair of headphones and a $10 pair of headphones, you know, it's just the money, you know, like people think that, oh, well, because this is like a five, a $10 pair of headphones, it has to be better. So $5 is fine. You're just listening to music. Yeah. Yeah. I see what you're saying. I, I think there's definitely, for me, there's definitely like a, this is good enough, a like benchmark for everything. Like, um, and there's a diminishing return to like, let's take my podcast microphone. Like I could get one that's $200 more expensive, but mine already costs 150 and it's already gotten like, yeah, gotten to a pretty high level of audio quality. So I'm not going to, I'm not one to waste that money, even if I had it to get some fancier set. You know what I mean? And then also too, especially when it comes to technology, and I'm happy you brought that up. I am a strict kind of techno recycler. If I will flip or donate some tech in a heartbeat. I mean, I have some tech right now that I haven't used in a while. I have somebody's interested in a first generation Windows Surface. Hit your boy up. <laughs> um, but I have tech that I don't use anymore, and. I never just throw it away. I will either sell it or I'll donate it to like the Goodwill because I keep like all the cords and like the adapters and stuff. Um, I actually just gave an old fight stick. I got this Street Fighter fight stick a while ago and I got a new fight stick and I just, this other fight stick literally just had dust on it. And I was like, hey dude, I called my friend. I was like, hey dude, do you want this fight stick? He's like, oh, I was like, dude, no, you can just have it. Like I'm not using it. Yeah, that's a good point. I, I think... Recycling things, it's just, it's just good habit. Um, you save money and you, you just get stuff better um, that you know someone else could potentially use. I, I tend to do that with um, electronics and certain like shoes and stuff like that. Um, like there's, there's these like really high end like Allen Edmonds like dress shoes and they have all these models. And usually you can get like Sometimes you can get them like barely used, like a few wares for like half the price. So like, even if I, when I'm rich, I, I don't know if like certain things like I'm ever going to do. Like, I don't know if just cause you're rich doesn't mean you should be wasting money on it. Like, you know how everyone, every rich person eats exactly. caviar. Like I heard caviar doesn't even taste that good. Yeah. And I have also heard that the wealthiest of wealthy people live so frugally like mm -hmm. truly rich people like the ex, like the the bougiest of the bourgeoisie like the like the, the richest people they don't walk around like with million dollar cars and stuff they have like you know nice cars they have like a lexus or something but they just sit on the rest of their money they don't spend it yeah there's definitely that like dichotomy of like okay these guys really want to put in your face that they are rich beyond belief so that's why they're buying the gucci and then there's the ones who are like you know we're we're trying to kind of not let you know we're rich because we're just that rich we don't want anyone kidnapped or anything or we don't we don't feel the insecurity that we have to kind of show it off in your face and they, they're the ones who kind of wear like the polos or the t-shirts and it's just like very low key clothing and stuff like that. Yeah. And again, that's another conversation. We can go into how wealth is presented to, at, to people of color and people who are white. I think that's a very interesting thing to think about as well, but we don't have to go into that. But yeah, it, it makes no sense how like newer, younger money will want 
to have chains, heavy chains, cars, or at least that's shown, has to have a big house. But the funny thing is a lot of people who quickly go and buy these huge houses, in reality, when they spend so much money, they don't have anything in it. So you see these rappers' houses, and they're like massive with like a chair and stuff like that. Like, yeah, it's minimalist, but the house was so expensive that they can't afford to put (laughs) anything in there. Yeah, I... I always wonder about that. I, I've seen Jason Derulo's house and it is just like empty. I, you think that's because he can't yeah. afford anything else? No, I mean, I don't. Jason Derulo makes a lot of money. I think he can definitely yeah, afford to put whatever he wants. I also think, too, I also think, too, the thing about wealth, which is so weird, is like wealth is always shown as, of course, modern, minimalist, but clean. So when you're wealthy, and it's presented this way on camera, which is so ridiculous. It's like, have you noticed that like rich people's houses never have lived in clutter? Like Kevin Hart and his wife do daily TikToks and their house is spotless. Like Will Smith will walk around the house and his house kind of has mm-hmm. stuff on things. But Arnold Schwarzenegger's house has stuff all around it. Like people, like remember when quarantine started and Arnold Schwarzenegger had the video of him like petting yeah, his yeah, yeah, ponies the or whatever in the hot tub? And the donkeys, and he's in the house, and people are like, "Oh, why is this house so messy?" And someone was like, "Uh, it looks lived in." There's this whole thing about when people get money and become rich, they always like buy these houses and don't put shit in them because they think that's what you're supposed to do. In reality, like people just clean up to make it seem like their house is always perfect. I'm sure that Jason Rulo has boxers on the floor. I'm sure he loses socks. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Like, I, I know what you're saying. I think it's definitely a perception thing. Like, uh, I'm I'm sure, like, everyone wants to be seen on social media as, like, so clean, but, you know, they're probably just moving the camera to make it s- look at that one spot that's very clean, and then behind the camera is all the yeah. piles of clothes. Exactly. Everyone every, – I actually had somebody on Instagram say this, like, on my personal – and it was such like a dick thing. They were like, oh, why do you have stuff in the background of your house? Like, is your house messy? And I was like, dude, I have a home. <laughs> like, I live in my home. I don't have to, I don't always clean, like, up to make the perfect shot for a photo. Like, I'm living at my house. There's nothing wrong with having some books on your table. That cup you were drinking out of can totally be on that end table. Relax. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a it's a mix of things. I, you know, sometimes I do feel kind of um, a little bit insecure when I'm like looking at my room and then I clean it because, um, you know, if someone else were to see that, you know, then mm-hmm. they they just make judgments about me. And sometimes I don't care about those judgments. Sometimes I do because they're colleagues, coworkers. Uh, yeah, I'm the exact same. Exactly. I mean, I'll clean. I mean, I have like, yes, Foley has some regard to what people will say about him. So I will clean up a bit and move things around. But also, too, I have places in my, like my house set up where I can record. So I have a spot that is the studio and that studio is always maintained in a certain way. So if I need to clean up, it's pretty simple. I try not to get it too cluttered up. But like my room that I sleep in. I have piles, not piles, but I have like some socks on the floor. I definitely like take my hoodie off and throw it on the floor when I'm done taking a photo for the podcast. Hmm. So you you did mention um, something and we don't have to get into it if you don't want to, but you mentioned um, how different cultures and ethnicities may kind of uh, use their money differently. Do you want to kind of touch, I'm interested in your perspective on that. Yes. Th- yeah. Thanks for asking. I'm happy we are able to talk about it real quick. So as history shows us wealth and, and media and also the way it shows us wealth is used two different ways by two different groups of people. You have the rich, the old money, it's mostly white. They have manners and estates. You think of sense and sensibility you think of, you know, Mr. Darcy. You think of these old white Victorian, mm-hmm. Georgian Vanderbilt characters and the stories. Yeah, Vanderbilt, the stories that come with them. But when you see black wealth uh, or wealth of color, 
it's always seen in a it has to be in a historical context so like when you when you see wealth in asian communities on tv and other communities of color like yes it is very much based around family but it has to be because oh the only way we have ties to having old money is we have to respect the elders and we have to do it this way and there's no freedom in your wealth when you're a person of color and you're wealthy in movies and cinema you have to marry within your race because you can only stay that wealthy when we see that white you know our white counterparts their their money is so deeply rooted in the infrastructure of the country and the war and politics that they have all this money with them so then we fast forward now today and we see like young black rappers when young black hip-hop artists get money now they get they get their chain they talk about their chain they have their clothing they have their grills they have their tattoos they have their hair you know they have their cars their entourage their their squat they have all these material items that they can that they can take and a lot of reasons behind that is that cre- keeps the narrative going that people of color's fulfillment when it comes to money is material. We don't value wealth and family, wealth and just relaxation, wealth and investments. We, you know, when we get money, it's not shown that we're investing in our community, that we are putting into our churches, we're putting into our community centers. It's usually seen that we are taking money and now we're a big artist and we move to LA and it's live and, it, and, it, and it's hip. Or if it's older and someone becomes, someone gets into money, it is treacherous. You know, people of color, when they get money and they're older, they want a new life. They want to leave their families, their spouses. That money comes with a lot of darker things. So it's, I, I think it's, if you know, if people should, people kind of stop and start to kind of pay attention to some things. Again, Movies and media and film are awesome and they're great and I like them. But pay attention to some of your favorite movies, some of your favorite shows, some things you see in the news, some things that are read. And notice how when wealth is brought by people of color, it becomes weird and like kind of strange, like sci-fi. Like if there's a rich black woman, she's Southern. She's got men under her boot who are like slaves it's it's weird it's so like strange but yeah there, there's a there's definitely a difference in the way those two economic kind of standings are presented to people right right so you're saying that there's you, you want to pay attention to kind of like how people of color are portrayed differently when they have wealth sometimes in you know stereotypical ways that aren't yes. unfair yes like when people of color get wealth, they don't immediately forget where they came from. They, you know, a, a great, a great, you know, thing would be every any sort of American football movie starring a black man. He's from the hood. He gets money. Mom, I'm gonna take you out of the hood. His mother, baby, I'm sure, but I'm fine. We don't need to go nowhere. This is our community. And then he leaves. He becomes rich. And he forgets who he is. And he's confronted. They're like, Alton, how could you do this? How could you be? You're not the boy I thought you were. You turned your back on us. It's like, no. When people of color get wealth, they bring people with them. And it is. And people of color do not always get mad. There's a crab in the barrel mentality, but that is such a small percentile. And by crab in the barrel, I mean people of color who drag other people of color down because they see they're doing better than them. That's a small group of people. But in reality, when people of color get wealth and they leave their community and start to build something better or build better into the community, everyone's happy for them. There's like, yes, some people do get jealous, but it's not always seeped in betrayal and hurt and pain. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, that's pretty deep. Yeah. So uh, segueing into happiness, um, you know, I think it's a good segue because I think wealth and happiness are probably most related um, in the sense that a lot of people assume that, you know, more wealth means more happiness, which I don't necessarily always believe. Um, So in terms of like, you know, you know, your thoughts on that, I I think we've already kind of touched on it a little bit. So I'd I'd love to kind of like go back to that. Uh, You, you mentioned something and I'm kind of the same way. Um, you have to have a set point. I, I think that's really important. Some people just kind of like 
keep going. It went more and more and more. And once they hit a million dollars a year, they want 10 million. And they're constantly looking for yep. more because they think that will make them happy when it never does. You know, that's why I mentioned six figures. I think um, that if I ever hit that, I think I really wouldn't need anything beyond that to to really be happy and, and do anything I want within reason. So that's that's why I mention it. And, you know, I still think of six figures as relatively low on the scale compared to what other people are after. You know, some people want millions and they're only content if they can get millions. Mm-hmm. But I don't know. I feel like I, I agree. I think that, you know, for me, like a hundred million dollars, if I made a hundred million dollars, that is a really good middle class life. Well, how you mean a hundred thousand millions of being at I'm sorry, yes, million. what did I say? My bad. A <laughs> hundred thousand. When it comes to a hundred, like a hundred thousand dollars, especially me b- being like a late eighties, early nineties, baby, hundred thousand dollars, a nice middle class, upper middle class, middle, middle, cl- middle class life. I'm cool with that. And when I say middle class, I feel like some people are like, Oh, like there could be so much more. What I mean by middle class is if I didn't, again, I think people need to realize the type of student loans that are over our heads as young adults, as millennials. I'll say the buzzword. I feel like I'm on Pee Wee's Playhouse. Um, But uh, as millennials, that student loan debt is so heavy that having relieved myself of that number would automatically basically make any piece, any money I get go right back to me and my family. And I'm good. I, I think that I think that the happiness has changed, especially with our our demographic, our, our our age range. I should say, people our age are understanding that happiness isn't what our parents told us. In the fact that, oh, you need to get a good job, make a lot of money, and then you can have kids, and then you'll be happy. So the happiness seems to be at the end, like after you've done all the work then you could sit and be happy so you can retire. Our generation is starting to realize that we saw our parents work so hard for the happiness that they they wanted or they were told they were wanted. And they got that, but the cost was so high. Mm-hmm. The cost was so great. And that goes into family problems and whatever there. But the cost was so great that we're seeing now being younger and getting into the age that our parents became parents, we're like, wow, man, I don't want to lose myself trying to just get to and just make a certain amount of money and have this checklist, this mark off. I want to live my life. If we, if we, if we rid ourselves of that student loan debt, if we're able to pay that off, that money goes in my pocket. That's a trip. I can take once a year. That's a place I could go visit. That's a down payment to a house. That's mortgage to a house. Like that small stuff could put me in a position where I can kind of sit back, live comfortably, do the things I love to do because I love to work. I think there's a lot of misinformation about millennials that we're lazy. Millennials, we love work. I love to work. I don't like the politics at work that come with work, and that's fine, but I like to work. I love to produce and do something and help people and give to the greater collective. But in that same scope, I need to be able to live the life I want to live once I'm done with that. And I think I think we're kind of just like figuring that out as millennials. Yeah, that's, that definitely is a, a new perspective. I think... Um, as I'm getting to that age, uh, I'm not there yet, but I'm getting to that age where one day I'll be a parent. Um, I can't imagine myself saying the same things to my children as my parents may have said to me, you know. And I get I get that parents of that generation had to sacrifice, work really hard. Uh, my parents were immigrants, and so they, they worked really hard uh, in the U.S. for my future. But I think we're just living in like a different time where, you know, maybe it's the world has changed or maybe we're just we're learning new stuff about what makes us happy. And um, at least for me, it's not about 
hating my life or, or I mean, I, I'm not saying my parents hated their life all the time, but just in general, it's not about suffering until you can retire for the benefit of your, your kids. You know, you can have fun too. You can find a job that you're passionate about. Yeah. You know, and also too, when it comes about passion and job and, you know, I just really cool that you're focused on money and success. We, I think we're starting to realize too, that we can have passions and loves outside of our jobs that if we can't necessarily find a job that is in that is our exact passion and an exact alignment with that that doesn't mean that we failed that means that we're able to make money and live so we can chase those passions one thing that i think frustrates the hell out of my parents is that i don't that i'm not this amazing artist that my, I'm squandering my potential by not chasing more to be the head of my own Disney. When in reality, I don't want my own Disney right now in my life. I, I like to do freelance work. I like to invest in my art. But what I love to do is I love to be able to do that on my terms. I like to be able to create what I want to create how I want and not be chained down by demands. My nine to five job can be the thing I do for someone else that helps me make money, that helps someone else make make money. But my passions could just be passions. They don't have to make me rich. And I think it's hard for my parents to see that. I think it frustrates them. Yeah, and that reminded me of a, a quote by Richard Feynman. Um, he was, he's a physicist. And it, I'm probably butchering it, but it was something like, the only mistake you made was assuming that I care or, and have to follow what you expect out of me or something like that. But the point was that he, he was doing stuff. Oh, yeah. He was saying like, you are assuming that I have to kind of, you know, meet your expectations of me, but in reality, I, I'm doing what I want. I like that. I yeah. Like and that and Feynman, Feynman turned out pretty I, well I, too. He's like one of the most renowned physicists. So yeah, I think there's definitely, Definitely something there with just kind of doing stuff for your own enjoyment. And that's something I, I, I uh, need to work on too. I think there's definitely times where I get a little guilty. I'm like, will this ever turn into something that makes money? Well, maybe it doesn't have to, you know, maybe you just enjoy it. Yeah. And I think what for me, I can only speak for myself that when I, when I start to, really push my passions to that money point there was a point in time where i used to go to a bunch of markets and sell my artwork and i was just so in i burnt out because i kept pushing myself to try to meet a demand uh that i an expectation that i had for myself that wasn't really real and i wasn't enjoying my work anymore i was just trying to make money and just trying to do whatever i could to make money and I kind of lost myself and lost why I liked reading and learning and growing. So if if I keep pushing myself to do something that I love just to make money, I'm going to lose interest in it. I'll, I'll probably lose interest in burnout. And I don't want to burn out on my podcast. I don't want to burn out with my art anymore. I'm just going to do the stuff I love. And if it makes money, cool. If not, cool. I mean, I'm coming up on the end of the first season of my podcast and I don't have a billion followers I'm not Joe Rogan and I'm not this millionaire and I'm I'm making this podcast out of my basement but I love it it's been awesome I got to put my friends on I got to talk about their music their writing their art their ideas right I got to put you on we got to share so many things and I think that is way more important and that makes me feel way more useful and powerful and really get to what I wanted to do with the podcast in the first place. I don't know. That just, kind you of know why I think it. you just have a naturally good uh, set point for your happiness. Um, I'm reading. So I just finished this book called the myths of happiness It's by Sonja Leombersky, who's like a top researcher in positive psychology. And she has something, it, it's called like the, the three tenets of happiness. And they are autonomy, community, and competency. 
And I think you just kind of naturally have all of those. Um, so autonomy is basically like, you know, having that independence and freedom and control of your life. Community, of course, is like contributing to the, you know, community around you. And then um, competency is just like you feel good when you you get good at the skills you you work on. So it, it seems like uh, he she also talks about like investing in experiences, yeah, and you seem to just naturally kind of know what to do in all those areas. Um, so that's pretty cool. I wow, man, thanks a lot. And I'm gonna please like email me that book. I definitely will read it and and look more into that. So I I am very hard on myself. I'm working on it. Like I tell my therapist, I'm working on it. <laughs> uh, I'm being kinder to myself. But I always want to be the best I can be at something. And to do that, sometimes I have to just do things I don't want to do and just kind of make them things I enjoy. So, and I, I kind of put that to everything in my life. Like, if you know, for those of you that follow me on Instagram, I have a dog and he is a bully breed. And I like to bring this up because it kind of like focuses just kind of like how I kind of see like changing things. But he's a bully breed. And when you have a pit bull, pit bulls are one of the best dogs, the best breed. They're very, very affectionate. They're lovely dogs. They're strong. They are so loyal. And when I got him, I had to understand that if I'm going to have this dog and for him to be a dog that I can love and trust and will be safe to have around my family and friends and in public, I'm going to have to commit a lot of time to this. Do I want this, this dog? And, but also, do I want this to be like the best life for him? Like, can I give him a good life? Like, I want him to have the best life. So I read up a bunch of books about it, watched a bunch of videos. I worked with him day and night. Every day I train him, I learn to like going outside more. Not that I didn't go like to go outside, but like I was pretty lazy. I got to a point where I like to party and stuff. So I would <laughs> so I would like be up all night and not want to go out anywhere, but I had to get up and go for a walk. I had to also learn to be patient. I was not in a, a very patient person when I was younger. I'm learning that now when I'm in a, as an adult, but I was not as patient as I should have been. But I had to learn patience because I can't get upset at my dog because he doesn't know what's going on if he's doing something wrong. I had to like learn to teach him. Um, so then I became like, I had to learn to communicate better. There are just so many things that like went into that that I had to change that's hard that's like really hard about owning a dog and anybody who owns a dog will say the same thing. They have to have that routine. You have to have that mental routine, but because I want my dog to be, to have like the best dog, like I love my dog. I want him to have the best life. Um, and I just want him to be the best dog he can be. I had to like push myself. I had to just do it. And that's, I, and that's how, how I do it. I just, I just kind of find a point. I fixate on it. And I just kind of learned to slowly make my way towards it, you know, and that's like, it doesn't, you know, again, I have my own, like, I have anxiety around it. I overthink a lot as well, but I try my best to just keep getting better at something, keep learning about something, like talking to people, understanding people, just kind of keep keep understanding the things I can control and the things I can't control to have patience to like, just stop and wait. And to, again, just be kinder to myself that that helps me stay positive. I'm like, Hey, don't beat up on yourself right now. Cause something bad happened. Just, just say, okay, it happened and moved on and move on. And you're not a bad person because you like this or you don't like that. Or, you know, just, it's, I don't know. It's the stuff. It's just, I, I try, I try. Yeah. And that, that kind of connects to the last pillar of, uh, personal development. We were going to talk about uh, relationships, uh, otherwise known as love. So that could be with uh, your friends, with uh, your spouse, with your dog. And it seems like you've learned a lot of good habits, good traits, you're, and you're honest about how you're still kind of learning. You're not perfect yet. Um, yeah, it's especially when it comes to love. I am a newlywed 
I'm going on two years of marriage and it has been fantastic. Congrats. It is great. Thank you so much. And there are so many things I had to learn about myself. I had to learn about my wife and I had to acknowledge myself and work on myself so I could be a better man, a better husband. And it was just so, there were just so many things. And I think as a young black man, newlywed, I'm, I'm hoping that younger people of color, young men will listen to this, that <laughs> it's, it's really, it's really hard to understand how vulnerable you need to be as a man to be with someone. And there's, it's really hard as men for us to realize how, how, how we have to legitimately stop and acknowledge the things within us and turn around and ask for help from others and communicate with our partners for, for like relationships to work. When you are married, when you are thinking about getting married, it is so important that you just take the time to keep learning to communicate with your partner. It's just like so important. It, it makes, it makes every day change. Like during this lockdown, before this lockdown happened, there was so much online of people saying like, Oh my God, I'm going to be stuck in the house with my wife and my kids. I don't have kids. So I can't speak to kids, but it's like, I'm going to be stuck in my wife. I'm going to die. It's going to be crazy. It's going to be divorce and divorce rates were going up. And they were saying all these things about millennials and all these things about different people in different relationship types and how they couldn't do it because of this. And for me, I thought to myself, all right, I've got two options. I can give in to like the ridiculousness of that false narrative and become panicked and like think of how am I going to isolate myself to make sure I can do this on my own and how I'm going to have to do this. Or I can reach out to my wife and let her know when there's something that's bothering me or let her know when I want her to join me with something and or let her know how I love her being around. Let her know how I want it. I'm creating space for you to be around me. Like right now, well, not right now at this moment because I'm recording, but in the studio space, it's part of the the basement, as it were. Um, my wife usually didn't come down here a lot unless we were watching movies together. But when this all started, the quarantine, I had let her use one of the tables in my studio space where I draw. Um, and I noticed that she was using it for work and I would let her use it. And I enjoyed having her, and I work remotely too, I enjoyed having her in the room with us, uh, for all of us in the room, like during the day, like we'd have the TV on the background, we'd laugh, we'd joke, and it took some time for us to find this energy of like working in the same area. But it inspired me to kind of create a new area for the both of us where she can work and I can kind of hang out and play games or watch TV or podcasts. And now we're seeing more of each other. We're hanging out, we're laughing, we're joking. It's been so good for us. So I think that when it comes to relationships, especially with young men of color, it's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to open up about things. And it's okay to understand that sometimes things may not work and you may have to go back and try it again and try to like fix something. I don't, I don't know. You... I think that go ahead. that's important. <laughs> No, I'm just saying, I think that's just like, that's just really important. You mentioned a lot of really uh, good, good traits there, patience, vulnerability, trust, communication. That's, that's really cool to kind of hear from. It's, I feel like it's, it's always such a, such a deep topic uh, when we talk about marriage and, and communication. Um, what, what do you think like your biggest lesson learned has been? My biggest lesson learned being married so far is that if I don't say anything, my wife won't know. Mm, that's deep. If I don't say anything, my wife won't know. I have to say something. I really have to say something. Yeah. I, I also have to... Yeah, yeah. I think, like, you know, we think we when you get so angry and you know, we all, everyone gets upset, but you know how you get angry 
and you're like, I don't want to talk to this person. I'm so over them, or I'm really upset with them right now. How how would how could you do this to me? I will never talk to you. How could you do this? That person doesn't <laughs> know. <laughs> like my, wife, you know what I mean? Like my wife doesn't know. It's like, you know, if my wife says something to me and I take it a certain way, and it's not, and I want clarification, I have to say something. I can't be like, oh my god this woman is a monster how could you say this and the whole day goes by she's like hey foley uh, we're gonna take the dogs out for the walk are we gonna do no i'm fine i'm good i'm chilling and she's like what the fuck is wrong with him and i'm looking at her like how dare you you hurt me so she doesn't know foley she (laughs) gotta say something (laughs) because then you'll be mad for days weeks (laughs) and she'll never know and then you're stupid then you say something mean because you don't know what's going on wow yeah that's yeah that's interesting it, may, it got me thinking about some of the instances where i've done that too and I, i'm definitely working on it I, it I it's something that i struggle with but um i'm working on re- i remember a time where i was uh, blown off on a date and um uh we we had gone on a, a couple of dates before that and Usually I don't like to be confrontational. So I was almost going to say nothing because I was just like, okay, it was whatever. But then I was, I just kind of sent a text message and said, you know, in the spirit of communication, I didn't, I felt upset when you did it in that way. Like if you had just given me some more notice, that would have been great. And, she, you know, I thought she was going to get mad and argue back, but she was like, I really appreciate that you, you told me this. Uh, I'll make sure not to do that in the future. Wow. See, and that's so strange because we automatically assume something bad, bad is going to happen when we talk about what's going on when we talk to someone. When in reality, a lot of times you don't know how they react. A lot of times they'd be like, oh, wow. Ooh, I didn't, sorry about that. I didn't mean that. Or they're, they're, they're clarify. There's a really good book called never split the difference i think i brought this up i think when you're on my episode but it was talking about just how to negotiate but also how to communicate with people and how to actually become Mm. a really good listener and i think to become a good listener you have to give people the opportunity to talk to you so if you're mad at someone and you're not talking to them you can't listen to the problem because they're not (laughs) telling you (laughs) yeah so uh in the spirit of uh respect to your time Let's uh, wrap up here. Um, DJ Foley has a podcast of his own called uh, the Medium Brown Podcast. Do you want to talk about that? Yes. Thank you so much, Will. So the Medium Brown Podcast, it is a podcast, a platform where people of color can talk about their likes, dislikes, and everything in between. We talk about pop culture. We talk about politics. We talk about media, gaming, regular relationships, situations, mental health, everything. So please check out the Medium Brown Podcast. It's on Spotify and Apple iTunes. You can also go to the website. It's the mediumbrownpodcast.com. You can contact me, DJ Foley, on Instagram at the Medium Brown Podcast. And of course, do not forget Twitter at Podcast Brown. I am on Twitter now. I am loving it. So please check out. Check out the Medium Brown Podcast. So let's let's just leave our listeners Uh, with a thought of the day. Um, I'm going to choose one and you'll choose one. Um, I'm going to choose mental health um, because I think that's important. Um, So my thought of the day is just uh, make sure you stay connected with your friends um, and and continue to build relationships and uh, revitalize relationships lost. because it is important for your mental health. Yeah, dude, nice. I hundred percent agree with that. I'll um, I'll pick a physical health. Yeah, sure. That's one of them, right? All right. So for physical health, I'll say start with something. It doesn't have to be a big change to make a huge difference. If you are trying to work out more, if you want to get more cardio in, but you don't like running or you're new to running, start walking. Wake up and take a walk. Walk your dog. 
your bond with your dog and you get some exercise in. Play more. Hang out with your kids, run around with your kids, or go outside, jump around, do some dancing, have some fun. Fitness doesn't just have to be lifting weights and grunting in the gym or sweating and panting for three hours. It could be 20 to 30 minutes of just you moving around in the way you want to move. So start with something. Well said. Thanks everyone for listening. Make sure to subscribe and leave a review for my podcast. I'll see you in the next one.